Welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope everybody had a nice quick break. I am pleased to announce our final three speakers of the day, uh, Dr. Carmen Meselin, Dr. Rita Srafalski, and Dr. Christine Langton, who will provide a review of EDCs on maternal child health risk factors and risk reduction. So kicking off this important uh, session will be Dr. Carmen Meselin. Um, Dr. Meselin is a professor of environmental reproductive and perinatal and, per and pediatric epidemiology at Harvard, Chan School of Public Health, the effect of environmental factors on human health, specifically reproductive health, has always fascinated um, Dr. Dr. Messelin as a research scientist. Her specialty lies in reproductive, perinatal, and pediatric epidemiology, infertility, assisted reproduction, and casual methods with um, perinatal um, application, a deep curiosity and passion for helping people with their fertility and pregnancy journeys and improving children's health fuels her daily work. In addition to her work at Harvard, Dr. Meslin also works with leading scientists on translational research on the underlying biological pathways that may cause infertility and adverse pregnancy and child health outcomes. She aims to inform clinical practice translate science into policy action and implement prevention strategies to improve the health of parents and their children. Dr. Messerlin, thank you and welcome to today's session. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that really lovely introduction. I'm glad to be here today. I wanna to share with you, um, well, my perspective on this topic and sort of what I see as the big themes and the, the, the sort of motivation for where we're going in the future and how we can expand on the work that's already been done and presented here today and sort of where the field's going and how we can really change the world in, in a better way through solutions and uh, mitigation measures. So that's sort of my my current focus. So I guess I can, oh, I have control over the slide. So I want to motivate you to think beyond pregnancy and how the environment really shapes women's health. I'm going to be focusing on EDCs, but it's it's a much bigger question than that. Um, the most important thing that I want to convey here today is this idea that reproductive health and women's health does not begin um, when a woman starts menstruating. It doesn't begin when a woman gets pregnant. It doesn't begin when a woman gives birth. It really begins in the health of her grandmother. And this is very important because the exposures that your grandparents had before they formed you really impact your health and your well-being and your longevity and your health span. And this is something that we don't appreciate enough, I feel, in this field is that really today, the couples that are alive and having their, their families for the first time are really the F0, so they're the grandparents. And so the motivation here today is really to think really broadly in terms of prevention to include couples as um, they emerge into the space of becoming couples and getting married or being in partnership and forming the F0s of, of, of now, which then forms the F1s and the F2s. And Thinking about this really gives us a lot of power to um, improve the health of young people so that we can have an impact on women's health and on reproductive health more broadly. In addition to this concept where the origins of reproductive health and women's health originates in your grandmother, so my grandmother's exposures and my grandfather's exposures impacted my mother when she was in my mother in my grandmother's womb, and those eggs in my grand in in my mother that were formed in her gestation formed me, and so that forms my reproductive health and my um, overall health. Um, and reproductive health and fertility is really a marker of health in general. And so we don't consider the impact of fertility as, as just getting pregnant. It's really you want to be fertile for your entire lifespan, for as long of your lifespan as you possibly can, because we know now that it's a marker of so many other things beyond just your chances of getting pregnant. So this is sort of motivation for today's um, talk. Um, the reproductive cycle is complex. Um, it requires so many different countless molecular processes to work in synchrony and harmony. And there's a real interplay between organs and tissues and cells. And this process starts again in the gametes when your grandmother was forming the gametes of your, of your mom, that the gametes there actually affected your health and well-being. And the timing of events and the timing of exposure is something that we need to also consider in the work that we're doing. And this really is an opportunity for the organism, for the, for the human uh, to really adapt or to have aberration. So there's, there's opportunity for health here. And this is sort of the message that I want to convey today. And timing of exposure precedes um, the blastocyst or the periconception phase. It really includes the preconception phase. Again, the preconception phase really being the preconception phase of your grandparents. 
the preconception phase of your mother when she had you, and then your preconception phase as a female um, giving a life and getting pregnant. And so those three preconception windows are really, really important to the health and longevity of, um, of offspring health. And so thinking really broadly to women's health, um, I want to convey that the preconception origins of health and disease are, are critical in terms of our thinking. Most studies have really focused on the in utero exposure. And really, at the end of the day, when we think about the conceptual idea and the theoretical framework and, and the epigenetic transgenerational multigenerational inheritance, that it's not just the mother's exposure in pregnancy, it's really the father and mother's exposure in the preconception period. And that can go back as far as the um, as the grandparents' exposure windows. And so thinking about this as our model, um, we need to think very broadly on how reproduction and how reproductive success happens. And in this, we need to consider that the environment and the environmental exposures in the total exposome here is not just the exposome of the mother, but it's the exposome of the father. And it's the total exposome, which includes the natural built and social environments. And again, through lifestyle and behavioral habits and genetics interplaying together, that this is where we can have aberration or adaptation reproductive success for offspring health. I want to... Um, propose a model, this integrated model that I've um, been discussing for a while now in my work in the last year, that really that mental health and reproductive health really interplay together, that there's a cycle that plays onto each other. And this comes forward with the built environment, the natural environment, and the social environment. So those three kind of environments influence mental and reproductive health, cause stress and ad stress or adaptation, and that influences reproductive success. Again, this being a key determinant of early life um, health and well-being, but also the opportunity to prevent and intervene early in life. And um, the motivation here is to look at young couples now as as a entry point to reproductive health and success for the for generational health and for population health. Going into the built environment, we've talked about this a lot today, and I know in the next day. Um, about EDCs, and I know this is the thematic area of this presentation, and I want to emphasize how EDCs play a part in reproductive health, and it's not just the mother's exposure, but the father's. So we know phthalates and BPA and PFAS occur in mixtures, and the mixtures are really important here, that we're not exposed to one single chemical at a time, but we're exposed to countless chemicals that we can't even measure in, in our bodies. And so thinking really broadly in terms of um, mitigating risks, I think we need to think about the totality of exposure. Here's a paper that we published um, just a couple of years ago, looking at parental preconception exposure. And the work that I've done at Harvard and work that preceded me at Harvard really invested in this idea that it's the parent's joint exposure that actually influences offspring health. And it's not just the mother or not just the father's exposures to EDCs preconceptually, but the total exposure as the couple. So here we have um, on the right-hand bar or the right-hand part of the figure, we see the couple's mixture exposure to BPA and phthalates and a whole host of um, um, phenols and phthalate mixtures. And in this paper, we showed that for every quantile increase above the mean, there was an increased risk of preterm birth, and that was for the couple's mixture. And both uh, members of the couple contributed differently to, um, to the total mixture in terms of the impact, but we saw that the probability of inclusion included the father's exposure to this outcome preterm birth. Likewise, we saw similar um, changes in um, birth weight, so lower birth weight with increasing quantiles of the mixture for couples that both fathers and mothers mixture of BPA and phthalates um, impacted the child's birth weight. Um, and this, again, emphasizes the importance of the father and mother's preconception experiences to really influence offspring health. And I think this is part of the really important part of how we can intervene and influence uh, outcomes. Um, we know a lot about PFAS. I'm not going to go into PFAS per se, because I think this audience is well educated, well versed. But what I do want to highlight is uh, preconception PFAS has not been studied before. And this is uh, through an R01 that was funded by the NIEHS work. We now have two papers that are under review for this work. Um, and this work was done in a clinical study at the Massachusetts General Hospital um, Fertility Center, previously data collected from the Earth study, and now with a supplemented new ongoing recruitment by new couples, we were able to look at a host of different outcomes. And I'm just highlighting a few really key findings here. Again, preconception exposure in moms and in dads influenced birth weight of the children. So we saw that PFOS, PFHXS, and the mixture itself um, of PFAS in the mother's preconception window influenced birth weight by about 100 grams. 
On the contrary side that we saw that father's exposure in the preconception period increased birth weight. And again, we see these kind of disparate kind of um, uh, effects in different directions, but also very important that father's uh, mixture of PFAS influenced the child's birth weight by around 80 grams, um, but in a range of 120 to, um, to 125 for some of the more known um, PFAS, PFAS and PFHXS. Moving on now to um, the joint effect of, uh, of PFAS mixture on birth weight, we saw again that the increase of every quantile for the mother's preconception exposure decreased birth weight in a linear fashion, and also the father's preconception PFAS mixture for every quantile increase increased the baby's birth weight. Um, other findings that were relevant here were relating to thyroid function. We saw that the PFAS mixture and the PFAS individual congeners impacted um, thyroid function. And this again was measured in the preconception period. And one of the reasons why this is really important is that we really have an opportunity to intervene in the preconception period, unlike the prenatal period where exposures have already been set, the pregnancy has already been set, but really if we wanna intervene and improve the health of offspring that we need to encourage um, couples to mitigate change, adapt new lifestyle habits that can allow them opportunities for better health, optimizing their opportunities for reduction of their body burden of exposure of different compounds and different classes of chemicals. Something that we found really recently that was just published in the Lancet Planetary Health is looking at nutrition and nutrient modifiers as potential areas of um, opportunities to improve um, our body burden of PFAS. There's so much negative messaging around PFAS being forever chemicals, and, and we know that they last in the body. They, their half-lives are long between two and 10, 10 years. And that they're forever chemicals, they don't biodegrade in the prop in the population in, in the environment, they don't degrade in the environment. And that leaves people so hopeless in terms of what they can do, right? Aside from changing some things in your home, um, it seems like there's really a hard time kind of impacting your body burden of PFAS. But so we looked at this and we wanted to understand what could people do in terms of nu nutrition and diet. And um, we scanned all of the NHANES data. We looked at a host of different um nutrients in, in NHANES participants, and we identified folate as being a real key player here, that um, the effects of PFAS were, um, were um, changed based on the levels of folate in people. And so the first paper that we published is really looking at how higher concentrations of folate um, in red blood cells decreased um, the concentration of PFAS in, in blood. And we saw this across the board for adults and for adolescents, that there was a decrease in folate concentrations for a 2.7-fold increase in red blood cell folate concentrations. And so this is pretty powerful because it tells us that we can have some, you know, we can have some impact through our, our health and our diet, through our nutrition to decrease our, our, um, our body burden of, of a mixture of PFAS. Um, we also saw that um, PFAS actually uh, modified the effect of some adverse outcomes. So we looked again in NHANES data and we found that among children that um, we looked at the mixture of PFAS and we found that for every quantile increase in, um, in PFAS concentration of the mixture, common cold increased um, across children between three and 11 years of age. We didn't see the same effect in adolescents and there might be some confounding issues there, but we did look at changes and levels based on folate. And we found that this re relationship and this association was attenuated when folate levels were higher. And so the effect in children is only seen among the group of individuals or children that had low folate concentrations, but not higher folate concentrations. We found similar uh, uh, evidence in uh, using Project Viva data where we looked at PFAS concentrations and the mixtures of PFAS concentrations, one of the things that we know is that PFAS influences birth weight. Um, this has been widely published, but again, we wanted to see whether or not this effect was uh, mitigated or influenced by um, folate levels. And so here in this paper, we found, um, oops, that I'm going to go back one, that um, that the, um, the lower both birth weight effect was really only seen among mothers that had low folate concentrations, both dietary and um, blood levels that we had measured in a subset. Um, and this paper was published in JAMA Network Open just uh, about a month ago. Um, 
again, opportunities for us to mitigate and reduce the body burden of exposure is really important. And I think the emphasis here is focusing on the preconception window and focusing on behavior and lifestyle and nutritional habits that might help us reduce the body burden, reduce the effects of these chemicals on, on um, reproductive outcomes and birth outcomes. Again, going back to this integrated model, we look at um, the natural environment. Um, water is something that we have paid a lot of attention to with PFAS, but in addition to water and PFAS, um, we've been studying disinfection byproducts. And this is a class of uh, species that uh, gets formed when um, we disinfect water through our municipal water systems. In the process of disinfection, um, species of disinfection byproducts get formed. And these have been widely studied in the past for um, causing cancer. But we've looked at a host of different outcomes, looking at water concentrations in, in our municipal water through NHANES data and through a study in China. And we found widespread effects on oxidative stress, on birth outcomes, on neurodevelopment, on fetal growth, bipyridal diameter, asthma in children, thyroid function, lung function, allergic sensitization, and other disorders in children that we haven't published yet, um, but are in press or under review. I'm not going to go into this data because I really want to focus on, um, the, here, here are the papers. Um, I want to focus on one additional exposure that gets some attention, um, air pollutants and air pollution, really important, but we haven't really studied air pollution in the preconception period. And um, through some collaborations with uh, McGill University and the Canadian um, Cerebral Palsy um, National Database, I've put together a, a working group where we're looking at this very rare, but also very prominent outcome of cerebral palsy that we haven't studied from an environmental point of view. And we're now producing a series of papers and a series of studies looking at preconception and prenatal exposure to ambient air pollutants and how that affects cerebral palsy, a very devastating outcome. And we found strong associations in the prenatal period and preliminary results that we have ex examined, not published yet, on preconception exposure and cerebral palsy, again, impacting offspring health. Um, this paper is under review at BMJ at the present time, but not published yet. Um, working our way down now to the final area, which is social environment and women's health. Um, something that's not received enough attention, but we have a paper that we just uh, got published in Human Reproduction looking at early life stress as a really important exposure to women's health. And what we've found here is that trauma and early life traumatic experiences has a whole host of mechanistic outcomes across the life course, including, among other things, neurochemical alterations, including um, disrupted HPG, HPA axes in young women, causing things like um, psychological distress, but in addition to that, an increased risk for things like premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PTSD, anxiety, depression, an increased risk of mental health disorders that then actually have a direct impact on reproductive health, on preterm birth, on infertility, on endometriosis, on PCOS, on early menopause, a whole host of other outcomes that are related to early life stress. And we've created a model for this. And now we're digging down deeper and finding um, individual studies, data sources that we can actually drill down on some of these associations with, with, um, with primary data. Um, what's really important here is, again, back to the question, which is fertility is a marker of overall health. A woman who goes into premature menopause has a host of adverse outcomes following menopause. We want women to be healthy and reproductive for as long as possible in their life course. And that's important because these, um, you know, the, the menstruation is protective for things like cognitive decline, bone density, heart disease, cancer risk, a whole host of, of things that increase the risk. So infertility is not just the problem and the solution being having a baby infertility and keeping couples fertile and women fertile in particular is really important to women's health, irrespective of whether or not they choose to have a child. Um, so this is sort of the model behind this, um, this paper. Lastly, I don't know if I'm running out of time. I might be. Um, if, am I out of time? Because I'm seeing it's 3.30 and I think I started at like 3.11 or something. Um, if you guys want to prompt me because I can end, I co covered most of the gist of it. Anyway, I will just talk quickly about the preconception intervention program, which is a uh, intervention that we've developed at the Boston IVF through um, funding that I received um, through an award at Harvard. It's a pilot study at the moment. We've recruited about 50 couples. We've measured urine 
pre and post an intervention. The intervention is to help couples reduce their body burden of exposure by swapping up products, swapping out behaviors in their home. And we create a whole host of different materials for this. Um, and we've created an intervention where um, one of our research uh, staff talks and meets with a couple and talks about food and drink and personal care products and home cleaning supplies. And we ship them a whole basket of things that help them swap out their products. And then we measure their urine again, a second time um, following, um, following the intervention. And these results are still preliminary. So I don't have the findings for the differences in the urine concentrations of phthalates and phenols, but we will have that um, in the next uh, couple of weeks to months. Um, well, we have a whole host of educational products that we have on uh, my Harvard website that I encourage people to use and to download for free. They help people understand how to reduce their exposure to chemicals. Um, last, last slide is about advancing the field, which is kind of where I was going with this talk, is really how important prevention is and early intervention is and how prevention, early intervention really should focus on young couples today that are planning pregnancies or thinking about getting pregnant in the next couple of years. How can we help them develop healthy habits, healthy behaviors, improved nutrition, improved exercise, decreased exposure to substance use, et cetera, so that they generate healthy eggs and sperm? And so we kind of impact their life course and their child's life course by intervening very, very early. And looking at the built natural and social environments is really a composite of how reproductive health happens. Um, and this is really a holistic reproductive life course approach. And we really want to move to a multidimensional integrated framework of health and well-being. And what I'm working on presently is using this through multimodal AI um, sources of data so that we can intervene on a much higher level with big data on many different predictors of women's health. Um, with that, I just want to say thank you to everyone at Harvard that works with me, my team on the SEED program, uh, program offers is the NIHS, believing in me with my research and science funding, my R01, the Centers for Disease Control, and our collaborators and our participants um, at, uh, at the Massachusetts General Hospital Fertility Center. And that is it for me. Well, thank you, Dr. Meselin. Thank you. Um, reminder, we'll hold questions until completing this panel session. I want to turn the next component of the panel over to Dr. Rita Stravowski, um, who is an assistant professor of human nutrition at Michigan State University. She also hold, is an active member of the Institute for Integrative Toxicology and Reproductive Developmental Science Program. Dr. Stravowski earned her PhD in nutritional sciences and is a registered dietitian with credentials from University of Illinois. She uh, remained at University of Illinois to conduct postdoctoral research as part of a T32 program in endocrine development and reproductive toxicology, followed by a K99R00 award focusing on perinatal and environmental epidemiology within the context of iKids cohort. Dr. Strabowski's re research focuses on a variety of modifiable lifestyle environmental factors that can be targeted to protect maternal and child health. Her work with iKids initially focused on evaluating associations of endocrine disrupting chemicals or uh, maternal me metabolic status with maternal sex steroid hormones in pregnancy. Um, her recent work leverages findings from these studies to understand the implications of chemical exposures for women's health after pregnancy. As a registered dietitian with expertise in maternal nutrition, Dr. Stravowski also works extensively to understand the roles of maternal diet, quality, and pregnancy outcomes. She is especially interested in diet as a source of environmental chemicals and investigating whether high-quality diets can mitigate environmental chemical exposures. Dr. Stravowski, welcome to today's symposium, and please begin. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, I think in the prior slide, uh, I was given some um, some employment where I'm not currently employed. I'm actually at Michigan State University. I'm not chief of clinical research at NIEHS, although that sounds lovely as well. So today I was um, really asked to talk about some of our work related to endocrine disrupting chemical exposure, specifically in pregnancy for uh, women's health in pregnancy and beyond, and also to highlight um, some of the research we've been doing related to diet and how diet can potentially interact with these uh, exposures. 
So I think it's not too um, kind of drastic to say that pregnancy is important because it, ha it produces babies. That's probably what we're most familiar with. But we and others in the field are really beginning to uh, focus on pregnancy as a very sensitive window for women's health because it happens to women and it could happen um, up to 80% of all women uh, in the world have at least or give birth to at least one child. So uh, pregnancy is an uh, incredibly sort of difficult process for a woman. It takes a, a very um, hard toll on women's bodies. And so it's not surprising that pregnancy um, can be um, a very sensitive window for exposures to various, various um, exposures, including endocrine disrupting chemicals, which is what we focus on. So um, we are all likely familiar kind of with these uh, startling statistics related to the increase in uh, maternal um, morbidities during delivery hospitalizations. So specifically related to um, the time a woman spends in the hospital during the delivery process. And again, this increased from about 1994 to uh, 2014. There are also some really interesting data related to the fact that a lot of these, uh, a lot of morbidities are not actually even noticed or observed until uh, women are um, gone from the hospital for weeks. So these uh, numbers from the CDC reflect um, increase in SMM or severe maternal morbidities uh, up to six weeks after, after a woman is already released from the hospital. But again, uh, many of us in, in the field is now just beginning to kind of uh, think more about this, um, are really thinking about the very long-term implications of pregnancy. So years and uh, decades beyond uh, pregnancy. So this is a nice um, sort of um, example of this. this. I borrowed this from a review, uh, specifically focusing on various pregnancy complications that can predict a woman's risk of uh, having cardiovascular disease or CVD. And I, I use CVD as an example uh, because that's what we study, but of course there could be numerous uh, outcomes that could be potentially uh, important. So some of these exposures or some of these pregnancy risk factors could include uh, pregnancy hypertensive disorders like preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, um, uh, and, and many birth outcomes that we typically consider as being critical for, for the fetus or for the offspring, but can uh, potentially also impact women's health long term. So in our group specifically, um, we are really interested in understanding how maternal metabolic dysregulations in pregnancy impact women's health long term, and specifically within the context of exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals and primarily non-persistent chemicals. So those that are in and out of the body within a very short period of time, like phthalates, bisphenols, um, parabens, and other phenols as well. So we're specifically interested, again, in cardiometabolic outcomes and uh, whether or not these exposures in pregnancy and the, these dysregulations in pregnancy can last uh, uh, for decades uh, into a woman's kind of um, the end of her reproductive capacity years and, and beyond. So to that end, we re currently recruit women who are part of our pregnancy cohort that I will describe to you um, momentarily. So we recruit these women to participate in a study called IMOMS, um, which uh, evaluates uh, a woman's exposure in pregnancy and how it impacts their cardiometabolic health up to 10 years um, after they delivered um, that pregnancy, essentially. So um, currently, we are just in the process of um, doing these or uh, enrolling these women into this IMOM study. So today, I'll focus primarily on kind of the left side of this diagram and really characterizing women's exposure to EDCs in pregnancy in our study, understanding the potential for these chemicals to really impact um, uh, metabolic outcomes, uh, and of course, within the context of thinking about the long-term implications of this. So today we've talked um, a little bit about phthalates, and again, in our group, we're interested in a variety of non-persistent chemicals, but I'll mention phthalates because I'll use um, our phthalate data as my example today. So um, I think earlier today, Dr. Gore mentioned that one way that we can classify EDCs is by their exposure sources. So that's essentially what I've done here. There are kind of two camps of phthalates. Um, we are exposed to the plasticizer phthalates via food processing and packaging materials primarily. And then some more sensitive groups are exposed via medical devices, medication coatings, and so on. And then we're exposed to kind of the sense stabilizer camp of phthalates via cosmetics, personal care products, um, and uh, home cleaning products. So essentially anything in our lives that has um, a nice scent that we want to last uh, for a long time. So why worry about phthalate exposure in pregnancy? A lot of this has been discussed uh, kind of in non-pregnant populations, but I'll 
uh, talk a little bit about pregnancy, we know that phthalates are endocrine disrupting chemicals, but more importantly for what we do, there are metabolic disrupting chemicals, metabolism disrupting chemicals. That has implications for a variety of factors in pregnancy, including uh, things related to pregnancy loss and altered birth size, to childhood outcomes in the offspring, including behavioral and cognitive issues and childhood obesity. And as is relevant to my presentation today and what we are interested in is um, related to maternal health during pregnancy and specifically related to met metabolic health and long-term postpartum. So um, I mentioned that I will discuss uh, a little bit about our, our work related to diet. So where does diet come into all of this? So um, as I've discussed, we're really interested in exposure to EDCs and maternal metabolic health. But we're also really interested in maternal diet quality uh, and maternal diets in general uh, as a potential um, source of EDC exposure. So um, finally, we're also, we and others are also interested in diet as kind of a standalone predictor of women's health, both in pregnancy and long-term. And so um, within kind of this context, we, we want to be able to connect all of these pieces together. And so I will keep coming back to this diagram because I will essentially use it as my example of um, one of the studies that we recently are um, conducted using, um, using data of uh, pregnant women. So um, a lot of this work that um, I will share with you today or all the work from today's presentation uh, leverages data collected as part of the Illinois Kids Development Study, which is a pregnancy and birth cohort that began with enrollment of women in 2013. Um, the cohort was part of the NIEHS EPA Children's Environmental Health Research Center and is now an ECHO site. So all of that just to say that we have extensive data on women during pregnancy and also their children uh, long after pregnancy or um, into their childhood years. And now with iMoms, we're enrolling the pregnant women into the follow-up postpartum. But as I mentioned, because that's still ongoing, I will primarily focus on essentially iKids moms. So the moms that, um, the women who were pregnant um, at the time that the iKids moms, iKids study was, um, was ongoing. So um, when we first began to sort of think about the long-term implications of phthalate exposure and other chemicals, we first really wanted to characterize exposure to these contaminants in our population specifically. So we, we evaluated essentially exposure to, um, to a large panel of phthalates that are part of the NHANES uh, assessment as well. And then we uh, tried to understand predictors of, of these chemicals in women's lives. And so some of the kind of um, interesting observations. First, we observed that essentially all women in our study, which is very similar to NHANES, um, uh, had measurable levels of all 19 phthalate metabolites, or at least all parents that are part of, again, the CDC and Haynes panel. The second thing that we found really interesting was that um, levels of the newer plasticizer replacement phthalates, so um, comp compounds that are essentially now being used in industry to replace some of the kind of known um, bad actors, including things like DHP. So those newer replacements were increasing over time in our population, first of all. And second of all, they were much higher than in the general population, which we found to be interesting because we have a sample of very high socioeconomic status women uh, who are relatively highly educated, and um, we did not predict this. So because of this, we sort of began to focus a little bit more on these newer replacements. And so for today's example, I will um, focus on one of these. And this is a little bit of alphabet soup, um, but DHTP is a classic sort of replacement uh, for the well-known DEHP phthalate um, and has been used um, based on what we know as again, a plasticizer that's replacing a lot of the places where DHTP used to kind of be. So um, this is kind of the general outline of, of one of the studies that we are conducting right now. And as I mentioned, this is what it, uh, the example that I will present today will look like. We're really interested in understanding um, whether exposure to DHTP is associated with maternal metabolic health in pregnancy, whether maternal diet quality is a potential predictor of exposure to DHTP, and whether um, maternal uh, diet itself is a determinant of maternal metabolic health. So one of the things that I kind of wanted to come back to is to, to think about maternal diet quality again, and um, kind of seeing it here fully laid out, why, why is it important to think about it in this context? So first of all, we 
Um, if we observe that maternal diet quality is a determinant of exposure to DHTP, uh, diet can become essentially a, a point of intervention. Um, so that's really important to understand. And the second reason is because maternal diet quality itself, as we know, uh, in prior studies or maternal diet components, maybe not diet holistically, but at least various components of diet have been um, associated with maternal diet, with maternal health in pregnancy and, and fetal development. So if we understand that, if, if we want to understand that, that relationship um, wholly, we really want to understand whether one reason why poor maternal diet qualities are associated with poor maternal metabolic outcomes is because poor diets contain um, higher levels of plasticizers. So um, essentially moving through this process, we also kind of wanted to understand um, uh, this process, this, this kind of um, more holistically by also asking uh, a mediation question of whether essentially the reason why maternal diet quality is predictive of maternal metabolic health is because again, poor maternal diets contain higher levels of plasticizers, in this case, DHTP. So I don't wanna to spend too long on methodology, but just to give you a little bit of context um, about uh, the timeline of events, uh, women are enrolled into, this, into our study at around 13 weeks, um, median weeks gestation. We follow them throughout pregnancy. We evaluate DHTP exposure in, the, in urine, which is the gold standard for assessing non-persistent endocrine disrupting chemicals like phthalates. Um, the, the pooled sample from these studies are then sent to the CDC for assessment of two metabolites of DHTP, which we molar sum to essentially approximate exposure to DHTP. Although we assess numerous markers of maternal metabolic and other health in pregnancy, today I'm going to focus on 16 metabolic factors that essentially provide us with a good uh, understanding of maternal um, glucose and insulin homeostasis, maternal infl inflammatory status, lipids, um, and uh, cholesterol levels. So in, for the purpose of this study, we assess diet uh, early in pregnancy to reflect uh, essentially diet in uh, the first trimester using a validated food frequency questionnaire. And uh, this food frequency questionnaire was specifically developed to assess diet in women in, in pregnancy. And rather than focusing on individual nutrients, we wanted to uh, evaluate diet holistically. So we essentially use the FFQ or the food frequency data to calculate the AHEI, which is the Alternative Healthy Eating Index, which provides us with a really um, nice uh, sort of um, assessment of diet quality. Again, trying to understand diet holistically rather than kind of at the individual level. Again, to just provide a little bit more um, detail about the outcomes. So again, the metabolic markers themselves, uh, which I've listed here, the same 16, rather than looking at these individually, we essentially used a data-driven approach or principal component analysis to tell us how these markers group together. And what we observed is that these 16 markers grouped in these really nice um, kind of metabolic pathways. So the glucose homeostasis pathway that included glucose, C-peptide, leptin, C-reactive protein, and adiponectin, uh, the cholesterol pathway, the lipids pathway, the insulin pathway, and the inflammatory uh, cytokines, essentially. So as a, to provide an example of what this means, we would expect that if somebody scored high on this um, glucose homeostasis principal component, that they would have high glucose levels, high C-peptide levels, high leptin, high C-reactive protein, but lower adiponectin. And we know that this sort of patterning of metabolites is predictive of glucose handling, glucose homeostasis in pregnancy, including. So moving forward, I would essentially focus on these five outcomes as our metabolic um, endpoints rather than the 16 um, uh, metabolites individually. So as a friendly reminder, one of the first things and maybe the most relevant for this, for this symposium was to really think about whether exposure to DHTP was associated with maternal metabolic health. And essentially what we observed was, again, if you see the five components that I mentioned before of metabolic health, we observed that, that DHTP or higher exposure to DHTP was really only associated with higher scoring higher on PC1 or the glucose homeostasis pathway, which again means that um, having higher DHTP would mean um, higher levels of glucose, C-peptide, leptin, C-reactive protein, and lower levels of adiponectin, again, signifying disruptions in maternal glucose handling or homeostasis in pregnancy. 
Interestingly, we did not observe anything um, in relation to DHTP with uh, any of the other um, kind of metabolic uh, pathways. So the second question, if you remember, now that we sort of settled um, this part of the equation was, was maternal diet quality associated with um, DHTP levels? And I've kind of inset the result here, and it's a little bit backward, uh, so I'll explain it first. So we essentially observed that having a better quality diet was associated with scoring lower, um, with, with having lower DHTP levels. And so the reverse is then also true, um, which kind of fits a little bit better with this diagram that uh, poor maternal diet quality uh, scores were associated with higher DHTP levels. Um, again, um, as we maybe would have predicted. Finally, to kind of um, close the last little bit of this equation, uh, what is the relationship of maternal diet quality with um, glucose homeostasis in pregnancy? So we observed, um, again, maybe not surprisingly, that um, having a um, higher diet quality was associated with scoring lower on the glucose homeostasis component, which again means uh, if you think um, the reverse of these lists that uh, women had lower glucose, lower C-peptide, lower leptin, lower C-reactive protein, but higher diponectin. So again, the reverse is also true that poor maternal diet quality was associated with poor maternal glucose homeostasis. So how do we put all of this together? Um, can we ask the question whether the reason, one of the reasons uh, or the co a contributor to why maternal diets or poor maternal diets are associated with poor maternal glucose homeostasis is because uh, poor maternal diets contain higher levels of plasticizers? So the answer is partially. So we observed that around 12% uh, of the reason that poor maternal diets are associated with poor maternal glucose handling is because of higher DHTP levels, which um, is a really important contribution suggesting that diet quality, um, uh, again, that DHTP may be potentially a, an intervention for uh, kind of understanding um, diet and glucose homeostasis and, and maternal metabolic, but that the reverse is also true that potentially um, diet may be a mitigation strategy for higher DHTP levels when it comes to maternal pregnancy health. So um, kind of where are we uh, right now? Uh, moving forward, as I mentioned, our, our overall goal is to really understand, first of all, um, the impact of EDC exposures in pregnancy and how they impact women's health long term. But here are some questions that still remain unanswered that, that might take us some time to kind of address. So regardless of EDCs, do pregnancy metabolic dysregulations persist postpartum? So um, if we observe that uh, EDCs impact um, maternal metabolic health in pregnancy, does that necessarily mean um, that you know, women will inevitably develop type 2 diabetes? We don't know that question, uh, the answer to that question yet. But if they do, how, how could this be occurring? In our group, we're really interested in dis disruption of sex steroid hormones, which again makes sense for endocrine disruption. Um, of course, the long-term uh, implications of EDC exposure are really not known for women's health, which is kind of the, the central hypothesis of the, today's presentation. So we're really interested in thinking about, um, even if we don't uh, necessarily see immediate impacts of EDCs on women during pregnancy, can we uh, observe dysregulations in cardiovascular disease markers um, and cardiovascular health? long-term, long after women were pregnant. And what about other EDCs? Again, today I focused on phthalates, which is a class of uh, non-persistent chemicals, but what about other non-persistents and what about persistent contaminants as well? And finally, we're really interested in continuing this, um, this study related to diet, both as a source of uh, EDC exposures, but also um, as Dr. Masurlian mentioned, as a potential mitigating strategy for uh, uh, chemical exposures. We know that um, good or high quality diets are anti, have uh, high antioxidant capacity, they're uh, anti-inflammatory. And so we, we want to understand whether diet can become kind of, again, a mitigation strategy. So with that, I really wanna thank um, my team who works extremely hard um, and um, many of whom generated the data uh, that I shared with you today. Um, also the collaborators um, who are relevant to this particular project. 
um, women who were part of iKids uh, and who are now again enrolling in iMoms as, as uh, follow up. So a lot of work for our participants to um, help us answer the questions that I brought up today. And of course, uh, our funding from NIEHS. Um, and I think we'll leave questions till later so I can stop here. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Lincoln. Um, sorry about that. Um, thank you so much. Um, I am pleased to introduce, although she's not with us today, we do have a pre recording of Dr. Langton, um, and it'll take about 15 minutes uh, to, to go through the recording. Dr. Stravowski, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Really appreciate that. And, and we will hold questions. Please post them in the chat. Um, and I'll transition. Dr. Langton um, is a postdoctoral fellow for the Women's Health Group on Epidemiology Branch of the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences, where she conducts reproductive and women's health epidemiological research within the study of environment, lifestyle, fibro and fibroids, a prospective ultrasound-based study to identify risk factors for uterine fibroid incidence and growth due to her interest in the potential effects of early life exposures on future health. Um, Dr. Langton also worked as a research associate at Connecticut Children's Medical Center, where she contributed to various research initiatives, including pediatric inflammatory bowel disease registry and community-based participatory research in childhood asthma. We will now transition to the recording. Good afternoon, I am Christine Langton, and I am pleased to have this opportunity to present research that relates to endocrine disrupting chemicals and women's health. In today's presentation, I will provide some brief background information on developmental origins of disease, and then I will go into detail on two studies that examine prenatal and early life exposures and disease later in life. One is focused on menopause timing and the other on uterine fibroids. It has been well documented that many adult diseases have their origins in the fetal period. The fetal origins of adult disease hypothesis was first introduced in the 1980s by Dr. David Barker, when he and his colleagues observed that indiv individuals born with a low birth weight had higher mortality rates as shown in the graph on this slide. This hypothesis is based on a phenomenon known as developmental plasticity, where exposures during pregnancy can alter the structure and functions of organs during fetal development. These alterations may be necessary in the short term to support survival of the fetus, but are potentially harmful in the long term, thereby influencing disease risk later in life. Through additional research, it became evident that the prenatal period was not the only time frame of concern, but that environmental exposures from conception to early childhood may affect health throughout the life course. This expanded hypothesis is now known as the developmental origins of health and disease hypothesis, and many studies have linked early life exposures to adult diseases. The first study I'm going to share today examines several in utero exposures and menopause timing, and I conducted this while I was a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts. According to the World Health Organization, menopause is the permanent cessation of menstruation resulting from the loss of ovarian follicular activity, and it is only recognized after 12 consecutive months of amenorrhea. Known determinants of age at menopause include the number of oocytes a woman is born with, the degeneration of those oocytes due to atresia, and the number of oocytes needed to maintain menstrual cycles. Although there is a fairly wide distribution for age at menopause, the average age in well-nourished westernized countries is approximately 51 years. Early natural menopause is defined as a cessation of ovarian function that occurs before the age of 45. Those who experience early menopause are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease and other adverse health conditions. It may also interfere with family planning for some individuals. Diethylstilbestrol, or DES, is a synthetic form of the hormone estrogen. From the 1940s to the early 1970s, it was prescribed to pregnant women to prevent miscarriage, premature labor, and other pregnancy complications. It was also marketed as treatment for menopausal symptoms, 
and it is estimated that 5 to 10 million women worldwide were prescribed DES. Early studies demonstrated that prenatal DES exposure was linked to increased risk of vaginal and cervical cancer in young women, at which time it was banned by the Food and Drug Administration. Later studies demonstrated associations with many adverse reproductive outcomes, and DES is now known to be an endocrine disrupting chemical. Menopause timing may also be influenced by prenatal exposures. Normal ovarian aging includes development of an initial cohort of ovarian follicles established during fetal development with peak reserve occurring about halfway through. From that point on, depletion occurs during the remainder of the fetal period and over the course of reproductive life. It is known that DES passes freely across the placenta and animal studies have shown DES to cause structural and functional changes to the fetal ovary. Thus, it is possible that DES affects development of the initial cohort of follicles, as well as the rate of oocyte atresia in the fetal ovary. So we examined the association of DES and menopause in the Nurses Health Study 2 cohort that was established in 1989 when over 116,000 registered nurses completed a baseline questionnaire. And they continue to complete questionnaires every two years, providing updated information on their medical conditions and health-related behaviors. Beginning in 1989, cohort members were asked if their menstrual periods had ceased permanently. If yes, participants reported the age cessation occurred and for what reason. For our analysis, we used the standard definition of early menopause. Thus, cases were participants who experienced natural menopause before the age of 45. In 1993, participants reported if their mother took DES when they were pregnant with them. And then in 2001, mothers of participants were asked to report if they were prescribed DES during the pregnancy of their nurse daughter. Because agreement was good between the mother's and daughter's reports, we decided to only use the daughter's report in our analysis as that gave us more statistical power. We ran Cox proportional hazard models to estimate the association between DES exposure and risk of early menopause. And we adjusted for demographic, reproductive and lifestyle factors and other potential early life influences. So here are a few demographics of the population at baseline. Compared to all participants, a higher percentage of those in the DES exposure group reported being of white race, had fewer pack years of smoking, and a higher proportion reported infertility. On this slide, I am showing the results from our fully adjusted statistical model. And just to give a quick orientation to the graph, the squares represent the risk estimates, horizontal lines capture the 95% confidence interval, and the referent group is participants not exposed to DES. So here we observe that participants exposed to DES in utero had a 33% higher risk of early menopause compared to those not exposed. So in conclusion, our finding of increased risk of early menopause with prenatal DES exposure is consistent with the few other epidemiological studies that examine this association. Because early menopause is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease and other chronic health conditions, this information may facilitate early identification of candidates for enhanced risk reduction strategies. And although DES is no longer prescribed to pregnant women, discerning the long-term health outcomes of in utero DES exposure is an important step towards understanding potential multi-generational effects. So the next study I will talk about was conducted during my current position at NIEHS and here we examine the association of soy-based formula feeding during infancy and uterine fibroid development in adulthood. Uterine fibroids are benign tumors of the uterine muscle that are highly prevalent among women of reproductive age. Fibroids may cause symptoms such as heavy menstrual bleeding and pelvic pain, and they are the leading indication for hysterectomy in the United States. Compared to white women, African-American women are more likely to develop fibroids and they experience onset an estimated 10 years earlier. Many plants have compounds called phytoestrogen. They are similar in structure to estradiol and can mimic naturally occurring estrogen by binding to estrogen receptors. 
Isoflavones, which is a subgroup of phytoestrogens, are primarily found in legumes and soybeans. And while they can provide anti-inflammatory or antioxidant benefits, they can also act as an endocrine disruptor. Animal studies have demonstrated that early life exposure to the isoflavone genistein can alter the reproductive tract of mice. And an Ecker rat model identified a pathway by which early life exposure led to fibroid development in adult rats. Thus, it has been hypothesized that exposure to these estrogen-like components during sensitive developmental windows may be harmful to the developing reproductive tract, including the uterus. Although limited, soy formula feeding has been linked to several female reproductive conditions, including timing of menarche and endometriosis. In a human study that examined the development of estrogen responsive tissues based on infant feeding patterns during the first nine months of life, the vaginal lining of infant girls fed soy formula so shows estrogenic cell proliferation compared to infants who were fed cow's milk formula, as well as a slower rate of uterine involution. And when soy formula is the only food being consumed, phytoestrogen intake is high as shown on the plot on this slide. And although soy formula is recommended for use in only a very small number of infants, it is used more widely. Up to 12% of infants in the United States are fed soy formula, and this is mostly due to parental preference. So we examined the association of soy formula and uterine fibroids in the study of environment, lifestyle, and fibroids. SELF is a prospective cohort that was designed to overcome limitations of previous fibroid research by using prospective ultrasound data to assess fibroid development and growth. Close to 1,700 self-identified Black or African-American women who were premenopausal and not previously diagnosed with fibroids entered the study. Participants were enrolled from 2010 to 2012, at which time a baseline ultrasound was conducted. And then over the course of five years, participants came in for three additional clinic visits every 18 to 20 months. And retention was high in the cohort with more than 90% of participants returning for the final visit. So self gave participants an early life questionnaire styled as an interview, and almost 90% were able to interview their mothers about their infancy. The questionnaire collected data on how long the participant was fed soy formula, and how soon after birth it was started. So using these two questions, we created a composite variable where participants were categorized as highly exposed if they were fed soy formula in the first two months of life and for a duration of four months or more. Our analysis of fibroid incidence was based on intervals with an ultrasound at each visit. We defined incident fibroids as a new fibroid detected in participants who were previously fibroid free and we ran Cox proportional hazards models to estimate the association between soy formula feeding and risk of incident fibroids. We ran three multivariable models. Here we included maternal and early life factors that might have influenced choice of soy formula feeding and time varying participant factors that have been previously associated with fibroid development in the self cohort. And here are some demographics of the self cohort at enrollment. The mean age was 29 years, about three fourths of the population had some college education, 60% were employed, 45% had a low household income, 60% had at least one birth, and 13% of self participants were fed soy formula during their infancy. And when we compare demographics based on soy formula feeding, the mothers who fed soy formula to their participant daughters were older at the time of their participants' birth and had higher educational attainment. And the participants who were fed soy formula tended to be younger at enrollment, were less likely to be smokers, and had higher household income. And here are the results from our fully adjusted model for risk of incident fibroids. Compared to participants who were not fed soy formula as an infant, we find that those who had soy formula feeding within the first two months of life and for a duration of four months or longer, had a 58% increased risk of incident fibroids. In this study, we observed that soy formula feeding during infancy was associated with an increased risk of ultrasound-identified fibroids in adulthood. And this association was strongest for those fed soon after birth and for a longer duration. 
Our findings are consistent with prior animal and human studies. However, these findings need to be replicated in other populations and point to the need to study infant soy formula and other estrogen sensitive outcomes. So in summary, the epidemiological studies presented today are two examples that illustrate how exposures during sensitive developmental periods may be detrimental to the female reproductive system, leading to adverse health outcomes later in life. While both studies support the developmental origins of health and disease hypothesis, more research is needed to better understand the underlying biological mechanisms and how exposure to estrogen-like components during sensitive developmental windows affects women's health. I'd like to acknowledge all of my collaborators on these two studies, but of course my mentors, Dr. Elizabeth Patone Johnson at the University of Massachusetts and Dr. Donna Baird from NIEHS. I'm sorry that I could not be there in person today, but I've included my email at the bottom of this slide, so please reach out if you have any questions or comments. And thank you so much for listening to this presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Madeline Stravowski and Langton for the uh, in-depth review of EDCs and maternal child health risks and risk reduction. And thank you to all of our distinguished speakers and each one of you for your engagement today. I will now pass the microphone to Michelle Bullock, Director of Division Strategic Communications on the Office of Women's Health Department of Health and Human Services for closing remarks. Michelle. Thanks, Deb. Um, good afternoon, everyone. As we wrap up the day, we uh, want to thank our speakers for their time and expertise and to each of you for attending today's sessions. Today really was a wonderful opportunity for us to come together to learn more about how we can best support women's health and support each other in our work. It was also great to see so many of you engaging with each other during the virtual poster session. And if you didn't have the opportunity to interact with some of the presenters or meet other attendees in the Gather Town space, we really encourage you to do so tomorrow uh, to build some more collaborations. Um, tomorrow's talks will focus on successful interventions to reduce the impact of endocrine disrupting chemicals. We'll learn about how to make a difference in our own lives and for the people we care about, as well as about the ongoing work improving women's health at the state and federal government levels. Don't miss these important presentations. If you're not able to make it tomorrow, we're very grateful that you joined us today. And we'd like to invite you to complete a post-conference survey. You'll receive that from us in the coming days. Your feedback will really help us develop future programs and events, ensuring the women's health information we provide remains up-to-date, accessible, and actionable. We also invite you to stay connected with us on social media and through our email list. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day. We really look forward to seeing you again tomorrow. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services.